This podcast contains explicit content and is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Don't say we didn't warn you. Hi, my name is Madison. And I'm Hannah. And you are listening to Who's Knocking? A true crime podcast. Hello, hello. Exciting day. Yeah, <laughs> Hannah's back. That's exciting. Um, where was she? None of your biz. Yeah, I was totally <laughs> Sorry, doing was something cool and important. <laughs> yeah. um, but exciting thing today, I, I went off about this on uh, Instagram, but it's our birthday today. Yes. The day that That's we're recording, right. not the day that this comes out, but the day that we're recording, which is October 6th. And I remembered why it's not a year for 52 episodes. Do you remember why? Because of our bonuses? I think it was because the first three episodes, we released them all. That's after why. Each other. Yeah. Okay. That's why the math. Did- okay. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. That's smart. I did not yeah. think about that. No, yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. <laughs> Now we know. Uh, now we know. Yeah. So today is the day that we released our first three episodes. Or I think we may have released some one day at a time. I don't remember. Yeah. But whatever. We released our first episode. It's also my friend Taylor's birthday. Shout out. Hey. Shout out, Taylor. Shout uh, out, um, Stephen Williams. Wait, that's his name, right? The first episode? Yeah. Not shout out really to him. Yeah. But Hope you're doing that shitty. Episode. He's in jail, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good, good. Hope you're getting... I hope you're taking art classes. I hope you're the taking art classes and you're so bad at it and everyone makes fun of how bad you are <laughs> at your art classes. So, yeah, that's it's our birthday, which is pretty exciting. I'm pretty proud of us. Pretty proud of putting out however many episodes we have. Uh, yeah. <laughs> something, 50 something, some. something. 50 some. And we've been at it every week, basically, for a year, which is awesome right um so since last week i have been watching the jeffrey dahmer series the new Mm -hmm. one that came out i don't know if you've been watching it but no but i've heard so much every obviously everybody messages me assuming that i would have seen it which i haven't yet i just like haven't i mean i I guess like the only reason i would really watch it is because just to like know what happens in the series i guess because i feel like i know everything about that case so to me it's like however many hours to watch this, like I, I already know pretty much everything that happens. And you know, Madison, we've seen the crime scene photos. So we've seen like, we know this case. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't need to revisit it. When it first came out, of co- well, when it started getting talked about, everyone was messaging me about it. My dad's yeah. like, look. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I was so like, cute. oh, I'm not excited about this at all. Like I'm not, I probably won't even watch it. Every other Dahmer series or movie has been garbage. Um, so many too. But then I saw that it was Ryan Murphy who, if oh, you don't yeah. know him, he does um, American Horror Story, which I haven't watched the last number of series um, seasons, but that show is pretty yeah. awesome. Yeah, I think the I think earlier it, seasons are a bit better. Agreed, agreed. Usually um, in everything. but Yeah. And so then I was like, oh, cool. And then I saw, what's his name? Evan Playing Peters. Evan Peters. And he's fucking awesome too. And then I was like, all right, I'll watch an episode. Chris was like, here, we can watch it because oh, uh, I'm going to let you watch it. He Finally, didn't. Chris is going to watch something with you. He didn't make it through episode one. He was like, oh. I'm not interested in this at all. Was it because he was scared? <laughs> no, he's just like, he's he's always like, why would I watch something that makes me unhappy? I'm like, yeah. We're Fair not point. compatible. <laughs> um, That's funny. So I sat and watched four episodes in a row and had some look away well I was you know I had the time and he was doing something else so I just was like okay but it was like because for me to watch four episodes of something I have to be really interested in it because I kind of have a short attention span it's very good it's It's done like it draws you in Mm -hmm. Um, that's good because sometimes the dramatized stuff is not that good well and I, I feel like kind of because I know everything like the first scene I was like oh I know this oh yeah that is is. I know what's gonna happen and I was like it's kind of cool to see the dramatization a Harry Potter movie well you've read the books a lot of the time the dramatizations of this kind of stuff are bad but yes that's what I'm saying yeah this dramatization is very good I've heard that I've heard it's very controversial because and I don't know how true this is but it makes Jeffrey Dahmer too redeeming or too likable 
it portrays him accurately, but that's I think that's the scariest thing. He's about not Jeffrey that. Dahmer. Yeah, he's not that unlikable outside of his crimes. Like his demeanor is not as off-putting as a lot of serial killers. Yeah, like his demeanor and his looks, right? He, like they portray him as having really greasy hair, which is very off-putting. <laughs> but um, yeah. He, I think, and I think this, what he did was like, you know, try to meet guys out at bars. So like him, like flirting with guys and being like, like Milwaukee guy with his little accent, which I can't do. Um, it makes him seem like kind of cute. Yes. But that's, the that's, scary that's thing, what people, though. that's what people think about the real Jeff too. Like he's so unassuming that's, and that's what's so terrifying is like, even yeah. I've looked through everything I've heard him talk. And even if you watch his interviews, it's so difficult to like, to merge the two, like who he is when he's sitting and talking next to his dad is such like a mild mannered. Yeah. Like totally. I would never be scared of this guy, yeah. but then looking at what the fuck he did is insane. I know it's so anyone graphic and could disgusting. be a serial killer essentially. Yeah. It's so scary. So, like, I get where people are coming from in a way, but I think it's, like, that's the fucked up part. And that's... Yeah. And it is accurate, too. Like, that's the thing, too, is, like, that is accurate. He He's not one of those guys that is just, like, so repulsive, really. That's the thing. You want to know what I think really separates him from a lot of the big guys that he gets put up against? Is, yeah. like... In in certain ways, he is narcissistic because it takes a, some sort of narcissism to, like, think it's fine to kill people. But he's not narcissistic in the same way. Like, he doesn't have that, like, weird God complex. Like, it yeah. just seems like his reasoning for killing people, any reason for killing people is obviously awful. But his reasoning for killing people is, like, way more, like, sad and pathetic. It's like he's yeah. lonely. He That's how he... I don't know if this close is to true. People? I don't know if this is true, but I heard that from Reddit. Shout out the most official source of all information on the internet. Of course, um, only of next course. to Wikipedia. I think it's more accurate than Wikipedia. I would say. I don't know. You know how you know how well it's sourced and vetted, and of course, yeah. Anyways, uh, somebody was saying on there that as a kid, well, like we kind of know, I think a little bit about his parents there's interviews with him and stuff but allegedly he was neglected a lot as a child in terms of like if he was crying he was left alone in a room and ignored and those kinds of things and like emotionally absent parents and I actually think he has that like kind of um Ted Kaczynski thing where he didn't get attachment at a really pivotal time in his life and obviously there's like so many other things that potentially happened in his childhood that people talk about but I think he had that like attachment disorder yeah and at least this series kind of... at least this series portrays that his mother had very bad postpartum depression yeah which kind of which the too. father treated as like she was just being shitty and annoying <laughs> so, annoying. so it's then then so that dynamic was really horrendous yeah and like that'll screw anybody up I just think like I mean and it's he had true. a brother and then nothing his brother as far as we know I'm pretty sure he lives in anonymity now but he his didn't need anybody as- so it's, you know, nature, nurture, whatever, but, um, like he can see, I guess like, I mean, so many serial killers though have really traumatic childhoods because I'm, I'm just thinking John Wayne Gacy. Cause I feel like that's like the comparable one. And he's, he comes across as so repulsive, so creepy, just so awful. And he had like a really bad childhood where his dad was really awful to him. So like, I guess it is more the, the vibe of Jeffrey isn't as creepy like no. I, I don't know what it is and I, I think it's like his motivation for killing people right. was like he killed them because he liked them so much and wanted yeah, them to so never leave up. which is yeah. so much different I mean I that's think, what he than says, like but... yeah and you know you can only go on what you what's being portrayed right um but like someone like Ted Bundy was like clearly like a woman hater yeah and also John Wayne Gacy too was like, like torturing I mean I guess I don't know Jeffrey Dahmer he murdered them and then did like his thing I assume. I don't think yeah, he was torturing I, as much while they were alive. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think, think you that could say he was drilling holes in people's heads while they were alive oh, yeah, and pouring acid in. So I think that could probably Yeah, that part's really bad. Was that part in the series where the where Konarak almost escaped? Yes. Oh, that's it's so, so sad. sad. I think that's the most like the most, the most upsetting tragic yeah and the police are just like because oh, they yeah, were there with the police boyfriend. were there oh yeah. my god I'm pretty sure those police like I actually I know what happened they I don't know if this is in the show but they 
briefly were suspended I'm pretty sure they had like some small penalty and then they were just reinstated yeah it was just for sure like no yeah no um disciplinary no consequences consequences, yeah not shocking so shitty yeah no because it's obviously okay anyway we could probably go on about this for a long long time but um let us know if you've watched that <laughs> let's not put everybody through did this. you just bring it up because it's like popular right now yeah and then because everybody literally everybody in my life was like have you seen it and i was like yeah i'm oh, not gonna watch it and then of course i watched it uh, okay yeah so i talked about it briefly in my newsletter grim weekly you can follow it at grimweekly.com if you ever have any problems signing up for whatever reason because some people are email me at madison at grimweekly.com and i can sign you up manually i'm uh, gonna look into that i have one last question for you yeah. that thing that we are doing this month that little that small thing is that coming out yeah it should have already when oh, already it's already out, out? Okay, when should so. already be out by the time this comes out so you know what we're so talking about. yeah we we put out these little little knockers we're calling them yep and so like for the really small yeah for the month of October there's gonna be a little extra content in the form of a little knocker knock knock that's right <laughs> thanks for reminding me so hopefully you enjoyed the last one and you will enjoy the next one yeah they are fun I don't know on, if that's the word for it on with the story yes. so today's case. Today's case is particularly enraging. That's oh. how I'll describe it. Good. Um, I talked about this case in my first newsletter. Um, I watched a video on this by a guy on YouTube, and his channel name is Dreading. I really like his channel. And that's where I heard about the case. And I kind of thought I wouldn't do it because I think a lot of people have done it. But I, it's an unsolved case. So I think there's no harm in as many people doing it as possible. So that word gets out. Um, And this is a case of Lavina Johnson. I think I have heard of this one. You you probably have. I've talked about it before to you, I think, probably. Okay. Um, That's probably where I heard of it. Yeah. And this is an unsolved case. And I think by the end of it, you'll probably be of the same mind as me. But we'll see. I. Yes. So it's an obvious suspect, you think? Or you have an idea? I don't know who did it. Oh, uh, so frustrating. But you'll see, you'll see. This involves the military, so. Yeah, I kind of remember this, and uh, we know the military. <laughs> yeah, great place, great place. So, Lavina Johnson was born and raised in Florissant, Missouri, to her mother, Linda, and her father, John. Lavina had one sister and three brothers, so there were five kids in the family. Um, Lavina was a great student. She often made honor roll in high school. She was a smart girl and she had plans to head off to college. Lavina's father described her as very selfless, a very compassionate person. Lavina cared very deeply about multiple causes. She was a big proponent of environmental issues. She was into recycling. She was a member of PETA and she donated to them regularly. I believe she was also a vegetarian. Um, And she also regularly donated blood. Wow. I'd be way too scared to do that. (laughs) You in particular. Um, Lavina wanted to make her country better and to improve people's lives. Her father said that of his five children, Lavina was the most like him. Lavina was not particularly interested in the army because she thought it would be fun or interesting. Rather, she wanted to relieve her parents of the burden of having to pay for her to go to college. Her parents had every intention of paying for Lavina to go to college, like the rest of her siblings, but Lavina knew that she really wanted to go to college in California, so she felt it her responsibility to help pay for that. So she decided. So if you're unaware, the American military will pay for you to go to college in exchange for service. I don't know how many years you have to do, but that's like a deal you can strike. So a lot of people do pay that for is cool. by doing that. Yeah, college is expensive, so. Especially out of state. Yeah. Although the military wasn't Lavina's dream, she saw it as a challenge and she took it seriously and she put herself, like all of herself into it. She was often spoken highly of for her mental toughness and her discipline. Lavina joined the military and she was quickly shipped off to Iraq and she was stationed in Balad. And at the time of her death, she was not involved in active combat. What year was this, Madison? This was in 2005. Okay. So... 
I'm going to send you. Okay. So on July 14th, Lavina spoke to her father and I will let him explain that. Actually, she talked to me on the 14th of July and she was respond. First of all, she was in Iraq and it's military protocol to assign a battle buddy. A battle buddy is a person that's commensable in sex and, and rank usually, and you account for one another 24 right. seven. She was there for six weeks with no battle buddy. The 14th, she called me. She was responsible. 14th of July, July. three days before she died. Right. Mm -hmm. Her responsibility was to open up the communications center in the mornings and then close it in the evenings. This particular day, the 14th, she called me and she said that previous day when she went to close the center, the soldiers wouldn't leave. So she said the general came in and ordered them out of there. Once they were out, he told her the reason they didn't leave is because your voice is too soft. When she told me that, I said, Lavina, listen, I don't like the way that sounds. I don't see why a general needs to be talking to a private. I said, but I need you to, you, you, you need to go to your company commander and tell him to assign you a battle buddy. You 19 years old, you running around there with all them horny men and stuff like that. I hope you understand you're in a vicarious position and I need you to, to take care of yourself. She said, dad, I can't go to my officers and tell them to, to assign me a battle buddy. I said, well, if you don't do it, I'm going to Lacey Clay because you should not be in Iraq without a battle buddy. Mm -hmm. I didn't do that in time enough, she was dead. So yes, yeah, so that was the lead up on the 14th. Then on July 17th, 2005, Lavina called home for the last time. There were three important facts that she mentioned on that phone call. One, she said that her unit was going to be coming back to the States. She said she was gonna come home, finish out her year and then start college. Um, but that would be later in the year. Okay. Um, two, she was going to start a new job on Monday, um, and she would have to go to a class to find out what that job was, and then she would call her family on Tuesday to let them know what job she got assigned. Um, and fact number three, she asked her father to wait to decorate their Christmas tree. And now, mind you, this is July, oh. and she's talking about Christmas, okay? She's planning very ahead. Yeah. Lavina's father had a yearly tradition with his two daughters. On the Saturday following Thanksgiving, the three of them would decorate their Christmas tree together. So Lavina told her dad that she was hoping to get a leave so that she could come home early enough to, to decorate the tree like she did every year. But she might be a little bit after that Saturday. So she was like, wait for me and we'll decorate the tree together. Lavina's father said that he had two witnesses who were there in Iraq. He said that later that night on the 17th, they knocked on her door and she did not answer. The next day, they came back to go with her to class. They knocked on her door, and she did not answer. By 10 a.m., she did not show up, and so they reported her missing. Dr. Johnson claims that his daughter, Levine of Johnson, was killed the night of July 17th. Now, on the morning of July 19th, the somebody from the Army came and knocked on their door to bring them some news. At 7.30 in the morning of the 19th of July, our doorbell rang. There's a soldier on our porch. He stepped in our foyer and he said, this morning, Lavina L. Johnson died of self-inflicted wounds. I was just overwhelmed. I fell back on the steps. It was, it was just a total shock to me. Linda was, she started bellowing so loud. I mean, it was, it was just a horrible echo that echoed through the house. It was just horrible. I said, wait a minute. Are you saying that my daughter committed suicide? And he said, her death is being investigated. The guy who was bringing them the, um, this information was a soldier, and he knocked on their door and asked if they were the parents of um, private first class uh, Lavina Johnson. And they said yes. And they knew uh, what that meant. And he told them that their daughter had died. And he did mention that it was from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. And so, wow. but the, so the parents were like, what do you mean? She died of a suicide? Are you, what do you mean? And then this guy starts backtracking. He's like, well, it's still under investigation. I can't tell you anything else. 
And this, of course, was absolutely horrific. It was terrible. Everyone, including Lavina's other siblings, were home. The mother, Linda, is on the floor. It's dreadful, obviously. But it was very obvious to Lavina's family right from the beginning that something was off. They were, it was out of the question to them that she had committed suicide. Yeah. What the army was unaware of at the time was that Lavina's father was ex-military. He and his wife, Linda, had served in the army for 25 years. I, I, don't, I don't know if the mother served for 25 years, but um, Dr. John Johnson, who's a psychiatrist, he worked for the army department for 25 years. So this man was very aware of how shit ran over there. Yeah, you could tell from the phone call, the or not the phone call, like the interview when he was talking about that. Yes. Now, and let me just take a second to talk about Lavina's father. Okay. This man is one of the bravest, most amazing people that I have come across during my research for episodes, etc. This man and his wife have so much freaking integrity and grace, and it just breaks your heart listening to them i feel that i've really kind of gotten to know dr john johnson a little bit through my research because he's kind of the face of everything so i've watched a lot of videos of him he's the psychiatrist he which really I said. cool he has been the face of the entire investigation with very little help he right. has gone up against the united states military which is one of the biggest scariest most well-funded organizations in the known world super scary He's handled everything himself so that his family doesn't have to deal with the hor horrible details of what happened to his daughter and their sister. Like, he basically was like to his wife, look, you grieve. You let me handle everything. Um, I'm sure everybody's become aware of everything based on all the media and everything. Right. But this man is a shining example of what is a, a man and a father. And I, I, I have so much respect for him. And I know that a lot of podcast true crime podcast like sometimes people go on about the victims or the victims families in a way that i think is like just like a little ingenuine it's like a little too much it's just like paints people as like angels walking on earth when maybe they weren't i say this in like the most truthful way i just i think that if lavina saw what he was doing she would be so proud of him and that's all i'll say i get a little bit emotional talking about him because i really like him yeah, he seems awesome. Yeah. And some of the, just the stuff that he's had to look at and be made aware of, which we'll get into, um, is just no father should ever have to talk and talk about these things and, and see what he's seen. Yeah, just experience that in general. And he just he does it in such an articulate manner. And in like he you can tell that he's just like, all right, shoving it down and getting her done. In yeah. just, like, such a respectable way. Anyway. So, immediately, John began to ask questions and request information from the military. And he started piecing together what happened to his daughter, and he was not coming to the same conclusions that they were. When John requested anything from the military, they were not at all helpful. They delayed, they stonewalled, and they made it as difficult for the Johnsons as they possibly could. Finally, after a lot of prodding, they sent Dr. Johnson about 800 pages of photocopied documentation, there, which, which included witness statements, affidavits, et cetera, on, based on their investigation, and about 300 black and white photocopies of photos as well. Dr. Johnson's brother, who had a degree in criminal science, looked over all of this stuff with him, and he looked at it all, and he's like, this is a murder. Right. So the official story based on the military's investigation, goes like this. Let's hear it. The military says that Lavina Johnson was reported as having a normal day. She was seen to be in good spirits by multiple witnesses. That evening, she finished up working, and she had changed into her jogging clothes, presumably to do some exercise. Later, she hung out with a male friend of hers. They went to the canteen, and Lavina purchased a six-pack of Pepsi and a bag of M&Ms. They both went back to their respective rooms. Then Lavina went to a computer, printed out a bunch of emails from her ex-boyfriend. The couple had recently ended their relationship, according to the Army, and Lavina was very upset about this. Okay. Lavina, um, and sorry, I don't know if she dressed in her physical training outfit earlier or if it was now but at some she ended up in her physical training outfit which was like you know t-shirt sweatpants and like this um glow like bright green band around your waist I, I maybe to be 
maybe as like a night thing. I don't right. know why, but they have that and like running shoes or whatever. Um, so yes, at around midnight, she then took these printed out emails and went off into a, a contractor's tent, which is a, a place she shouldn't have been allowed to go on the military base. Then she sat in the tent, set fire to these emails using a pack of matches and an aerosol can of hairspray. And then she put the end of a 40 inch M16 rifle in her mouth and pulled the trigger. And so she so- wasn't in her like rooming when this happened. No, she was in. So how it works is like, I don't know exactly how it works, but there's a military base and there was some contractors, I guess, doing some sort of construction and okay. they had a tent for their like work stuff or break time or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was an off limits tent to the know, army soldiers personnel. like her. Um, and that's where she ended up. And I don't know where that is in relation to her room or whatever, but it is like, oh, a, a walk away. So did they find like shriveled up remains of these emails? How did they know this all happened? Yes, they found the charred remains of the emails. And it was like clearly the emails. Yes. And I think I don't know if they have um, proof that she printed them out or whatever, or like, you know, there was like remnants of paper. So I I guess if you like cross reference with her emails, you could probably tell that those that's what they were, but they were mostly gone. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And we'll get into all the evidence because this is where this is this is the bulk of it is like what they said, what Mr. Johnson is saying, Dr. Johnson is saying. Yeah. Whatever. So that's their story and they're sticking to it. Okay. So we'll get into her body. When the military sent Lavina's body home to Missouri, they cautioned the family that they shouldn't look at her body. They advised the Johnsons that they have a closed casket funeral to avoid having to see Lavina in this state. And now Mr. Johnson is Dr. Johnson. He's like, he, he knows he's a military guy. He's thinking an M16 rifle, like her face is gone. That's what he assumes. Wow. But they were also very suspicious. So they looked anyway. And what they discovered was pretty shocking. Her face was intact, but she had a bunch of bruises and scratches and wounds all over her face. She had a broken nose, which had been put back into place. And everybody says, like, it was, like, cosmetic surgery back into place. She had loose and broken teeth. And it looked like she'd been... Pre- Wait, how could he tell that it had been broken? Um, like, I don't... Bru- I think, like, like bruising, swelling and stuff. So all of these photos, you can see them if you want to see them. Have you looked at They're them? They're out there. I've seen a lot of them. Yes. Um, And you, like... It's, I don't know if, um like... I think that he's had people like look at these things too very closely or whatever and determined. I think there's obviously a way that you can determine that. Right. Um, But his claim is that, and everything I'm saying too, like that he found, like this is his claim based on his expert witnesses. Um, He's got lawyers involved. He's taken this to other people. Um, I, I can't say for sure. I can't say anything for sure. All I can say is what he's saying and what the military is saying. Yeah. Um, And so, you know, if anybody's looking for, like, definite answers, they're not here. But anyway, um, so they saw all this. It looked like she'd been very badly beaten before her death, which didn't make any sense if she all of a sudden just up and shot herself when she was perfectly fine during the day. Another super weird thing was that she was wearing white gloves and they discovered they had been super glued to her hands before she was sent That's home. Like literally, why? Why did that happen? The family found out later that Lavina had third degree burns on her hands. So it is assumed that the gloves were glued to her hands to conceal that fact. What's a third degree burn? A third degree burn is like a very bad burn i think burns come in different degrees there's like first degree second degree third degree and i believe the higher you go the worse they are oh but also she was burning the emails allegedly right so and we'll get into later at the crime scene the whole tent was on fire certain like because she'd like set the things on fire and then shot herself so there's a bench involved the bench is like all burned there there's various um eyewitnesses who like speak about the the fire in various degrees um it's not uh completely set in stone like how on fire everything was but there was fire okay 
Okay, so then we get into the logistics of her shooting herself. So Lavina was five foot one, very small. Nobody has been able to figure out just how somebody that size would be able to put a gun that size in their mouth and reach the trigger. This is the claim of Lavina's family. It doesn't make sense, according to them, that it um, because an N16 rifle is a very long rifle. It's 40 inches long. And they claim that it's she just her arms simply were not long enough. Um, it is possible that she could have pulled the trigger with her toes, but the army claims based on their photographic evidence that she was found in her shoes. So she could not have pulled the trigger with her toes. Right. To this day, this has not been accounted for. Now, in the official forensic report, the gun does not have Lavina's fingerprints on it. She was not wearing gloves. Now, just because somebody touches something does not necessarily mean that they will leave behind usable prints. It's likely that they will, but that's not always the case. But the military does not explain anywhere anything about this in their records. In the official report, a first responder also claims to have moved the gun when he got to the crime scene. But interestingly, his fingerprints are also not on the gun. This has led many people to speculate that the gun was actually wiped clean after the fact. Lavina also lacked any gunpowder residue on her anywhere. There is also, the military did no DNA testing on the gun, which seemed shady because it was alleged that she had the gun in her mouth. So if she had had the gun in her mouth, her DNA 100% would have been on the gun, and that would have yeah. been a huge indicator. Though it doesn't necessarily prove that she did it. Somebody could have put a gun in her mouth. Um, they also claim that she had a cut on her finger. So if she had pulled the trigger, there should have been DNA on the trigger as well. But again, that was never, a DNA testing was never done in their investigation. So the crime scene. So inside the tent, there was an aerosol can and a book of matches, which is alleged that she used to start uh, the fire on these documents. Her fingerprints were not found on either of these items. In fact, her fingerprints were not found anywhere inside of the tent. Interesting. Um, I'm also not sure why anyone would need an aerosol spray in addition to matches to light some papers on fire. Like, just like that would just be for shits, really. Yeah, unless you're like a teenage boy, why would you be exactly. doing that? If you're like sad, lighting emails on fire, I don't know. Personally, like it's fun, but yeah, I'm, that's my own little take. But it seems like I mean, everything about this is like it's paper. a little weird. Um, another fact that doesn't seem to add up is that in addition to inside the tent, her blood was actually found on the outside of the tent and there was debris on her back. So Donald Watkins. What the fuck? Donald Watkins is another character in this story. He is the family's lawyer who Shut actually out. he saw everything go down and he reached out to them and wanted to like look into it and stuff. He was interested. Cool. Um, and he says that this suggests that the event that led to her death occurred outside of the tent and she was later dragged inside the tent. I'd buy that. She was absolutely shot inside the tent based on the like the blood around her head. Yeah. But clearly she was attacked. Clearly she was beaten. Something happened to her. She she sustained a number of injuries and he so he claims that that happened outside the tent oh. then there's the bullet so there was no mention in any of the reports about the bullet being found it is not in evidence and if it were true that lavina put the gun inside her mouth and shot herself the bullet should have been found there was a hole in the top left hand side of her head which the military contends is the exit wound so they say she shot herself in the mouth and it flew out the top of her head okay a shell casing was found under one of Lavina's legs, but even that um, only came to light much later. And it was the shell casing, not the actual bullet. So that's, if anybody doesn't know, when you shoot a gun, like the, it's in a shell. I, I, and I believe, like, I don't know. Oh, yeah. But I think this the shell falls out where the bullet shoots. Okay. Right? Yeah. So there's a lot of debate about this gunshot wound. Like I said, the military contends that it went through the mouth out the top left-hand side of her head. Um, and the hole was found up there. Um, and this is the exit wound of Lavina shooting herself. As I said, not a gun expert by any means. So I'm taking John Johnson's word here. Um, if anybody is a gun expert, I'd, I'd love for you to go off in the comments and tell me something I don't know about this. Lavina's father is a veteran, very familiar with the M16 service rifle as he's used it for a number of years. And yeah. he asserts that this does not make sense. 
He says that for one thing, shooting yourself in that manner with this type of rifle would have caused so much more damage to the face. He's He really thinks that it, this would have essentially exploded her head. And he explains like it's a spinning, spinning type of bullet. Like it doesn't, it's not just a straight trajectory and it's, it is that way to cause damage, right? Yeah. He says that the bullet hole looks a lot more like a nine millimeter gunshot that went then he thinks that the the bullet hole at the top is the the entrance wound okay and which makes it look like and he says so that if it was a nine millimeter and she were to be shooting herself which she couldn't have because the gun was nowhere he's like she she was right-handed so she wouldn't have done it on the left side she would have done it on the right side but interesting he says that if if the, sh- the gunshot wound was at the top, then the bullet should have lodged in her tongue. Was there a bullet found in her tongue? Short answer, no. But we'll get to that a bit later. Okay. I'm trying to do this chronologically, but a lot of this information did not come at me chronologically. So it might feel a little all over the place, but we will get to it. Okay. So that is the contention with the gunshot wound and i don't know i'm no gun expert i don't know these are not things that i know anything about um but that is that is the debate so we talked a little bit about their first report but i want to go into some of the other things that were mentioned in the report so the report made mention um in a bunch of places that lavina was very depressed and that she had wanted to take her own life and that was used as evidence that she committed suicide But it seems that there were multiple witness statements taken from fellow soldiers who knew Lavina and were friends of hers who explicitly said that she was very happy and healthy and not depressed. In fact, all but one statement were consistent with that perspective. That on top of the fact that she was in communication with her family constantly right up until her death, and she seemed absolutely fine to them. She was initiating plans for the future, both career-wise, talking about her new job and school, and with her family. She was discussing Christmas plans with them. And like, she was bringing that up herself. It wasn't that they were like, hey, are you coming home for Christmas? And she's like, yeah. It was. She was like, in December, I'm going to be coming home. Wait for me. That's very forward thinking for Definitely. two days before you m- kill yourself. Yeah. John spoke to two of her friends that she talked to, that she talked about in letters to her family. And both of them told John that she was absolutely not contemplating suicide and not depressed. Both of them do not believe that Lavina killed herself. And I think- Does anybody? (laughs) There's a lot of people kill themselves and and you're like, oh my God, I I had no idea. Like you never- Definitely. You're right. That's true. But the evidence. Yes. It just like, the the army claims they have all this evidence that she was depressed, but they're not really- Yeah. Everybody else. It's true. A lot of people I've- heard of many cases where people commit suicide or even like uh, even murder suicide in some cases and like their acquaintances people around them had no idea they were mentally unwell so yeah that's possible possible. that's possible I guess but nothing else points to that so yeah it's possible but like let's take it in context right yeah Um, and I'm gonna send you this clip of Navina Johnson's father and I will let him go a little bit further into some of the inconsistencies Um, oh god I just I think he's I like listening to him so I wanted to put him in a little bit what happened to her debit card that she used when she went to the PX they never accounted for that even though they said what she bought what happened to her dog tags Reedy said she was identified by her dental records that's interesting because her teeth were messed up. Of course, he said there was nothing wrong with her teeth. There's just nothing that makes sense. And when people read this stuff, they come to me and they'll say, well, everything is so confusing. Well, it's confusing because it's conflicting. Nothing matches. I mean, this doesn't, nothing suggests that this is a suicide. And here's something else. A reporter told me that the Army told them that this was a thorough investigation and they generated 1,800 pages of paperwork. But that's not what their paperwork says. Their paperwork says they didn't do an investigation. It was cut off. In addition to that, what the heck do you have to account for in 1,800 pages if it was a suicide? That's simple. If it was a suicide, that was, it, would, it would have been a simple process. This could have been a simple process even if it were a murder. They could have came to me and said, look, somebody killed your daughter. We got them. We're going to punish them. 
this would have been all over. But you come with this ridiculous notion like you just know for a fact you can just tell a family anything and they'll accept it. Well, maybe family A and family B did, but I'm family C and I didn't accept it. You know, a lot of this, I'll just say, like, I don't know where he like he's saying a lot of things that I don't know exactly where he got proof of them. And they get repeated a lot. And I'll like I'll point out when those things are um, being said that I'm like, you know, I don't know that what you're saying is true, but there's just so many inconsistencies, so yeah, many, for way sure. too many for them all to not be. And correct. even like one or two of them are already enough to make it extremely suspicious. And then when you take everything together, it's just like, who exactly. are they trying to fool here? The fact is they, whoever, I don't know, this is like obviously speaking early, like into you telling me this. I don't know obviously who did it, but it kind of shows that like the military or whoever is responsible kind of knows that like we could just tell them anything. They can't fuck with us. We can just make up a really fake, obviously bad, like untrue alibi or story and he can't do it. And we can just it. say, that's it. Bye. We're done. Like. So, okay. So then there's the question of the ex boyf So when John oh, questioned, yeah. okay. when John questioned the army, that this is the alleged reason that she's so depressed, right? When John questioned the army asking about proof that they had that Lavina was depressed, they told them that she had recently begun a sexual relationship with another soldier and that he had given her an std which caused her depression so that on top of the other that this this is just a guy in a relationship but then i will also talk about the ex-boyfriend too with the, that belonged to the emails now there are records showing that a doctor diagnosed an std as condyloma and What's had that? prescribed medication it's an std i don't Never heard of that. I didn't look. I, I've heard of it before. Oh. Um, but I don't think it's very common. Is it serious? No, it requires medication to go away. Okay. I don't think it's, it's not like syphilis. Or, I think it. syphilis is curable. It's not like AIDS. Yeah. Anyway. Or like so, herpes. Yeah. It's not. It's not. It's you know, not one of the big ones that everyone knows about. So. Yeah. So when John came back saying that he never received the medication or seen any proof that she'd taken any, they responded by saying that she had refused treatment. What fucking 19-year-old girl, she's 19, by the way, I don't know if I mentioned that. What 19-year-old girl finds out that they have an STD and somebody gives them medication and they're like, no, yeah, just, I'll just stick with it. Yeah. In what world? That makes no sense. The army then went on to say that they knew Lavina was depressed because she'd started eating a lot more ice cream and she was smoking cigarettes. I guess I'm depressed then. <laughs> Just kidding. I don't smoke cigarettes, but I eat a fuck ton of ice yeah, cream. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was the army's version of events. Um that she had started a sexual relationship and gotten the STD. The okay. other version, which Lavina's father was able to figure out, I believe I, this is the part that I don't know how he came up with this narrative. I assume it's from talking to people, but I don't know. And if anybody does know where this came from, I would love to know. I don't not think it's true. I just don't know where it came from. Okay. But Lavina's father, um, he, his version of events was that Lavina had actually been raped. And she had tried to report that rape, but she had been blocked and coerced by people higher up in rank than her into not following through on these complaints. And this kind of situation is sadly very common in the American military, especially when it comes to young women serving overseas. Um, so, like I said, I just I don't know the source of this information. So I'm just telling you that I don't know where the source of that information Fair, comes yeah. from. But Lavina's father well, says it as would fact. she have mentioned it to him? She did not like mention it to calls? her parents. Okay. Specifically, he found out about this after her death. Which, like, her not mentioning it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. I could not. Even if, like, if it did happen, I could very easily see her not, want, like, feeling ashamed. It's, it's so fresh. Like, she probably wasn't ready to talk about it. So, like, I, I buy that story. But obviously, I'm coming from the perspective of, like, a woman. And it's a completely, like, it's Bible. believable to me Bible for sure to believe. i'm just yeah. saying i don't know like i didn't see documentation yeah or, you know i didn't hear any witnesses say this got it um but if anybody does know where that piece of information came from please hit us up in the comments yeah um 
Um, and then there was the case of the ex-boyfriend, which is a guy that she was seeing back home. And once yeah. she came out to uh, Balad, Iraq, they ended up breaking up over email, the army contends. And that's why she was upset, even though the breakup would have happened um, like m- multiple weeks before prior and multiple people say that she was not very upset about this breakup that it was like a mutual thing and that she figured that when she came back to the states that they would get back together but we know there was a breakup yes so those are the sources of the army's contention that she was depressed okay and that's that's what they had on the depression side um so when john inquired about this whole rape situation the army told him that it was no big deal that it was no rape that it was a um consensual Consensual, relationship that she ended up getting an std from they also said that they were unable to identify who this person was even though they knew all the details of it um and this person was not a suspect in the investigation because no sexual assault had occurred during the altercation that resulted in Lavina's death that's their that's their story and again they're sticking to it so going back and forth with the army was getting Lavina's family nowhere It was extremely frustrating, and I can only imagine it was downright traumatizing. So Lavina's father did all he could do, uh, did all he could to take this story to the media. And people, when they found out about it, were livid for obvious reasons. And for some reason, maybe just general stupidity, the Army decided to release a 300-page document that detailed their investigation. This document is heavily redacted. I've seen it. I've read through quite a bit of it. It's like basically talks about their investigation but this document was full of discrepancies and bullshit that only served to make the johnson's case for them first of all there was four or so people who showed up at the scene and they all described the scene the crime scene quite differently some of them say they found her underneath a bench some of them say she was partially on fire some say the rifle was on top of her some say it wasn't the photos so inconsistent like these things are all very different Yes. The photos of her, like that they took of the crime scene, have her laying down um, with the gun on top of her. And then there's photos of the gun like far away from her. Um, There's a huge pool of blood over her head. um, And one of her arms, no, the the photos do not have the gun over her, but they say that a couple people say it was found over top of her. And her arm is found over her head like this. Yeah. Um, But it's, very unclear if anything was moved prior to the photo and based on all these witness statements and the first responders the entire crime scene was completely contaminated so unfortunately there's very little i think you can infer from that um because i don't think we have an accurate picture of what the real crime scene looked like definitely not so in response to that report And the previous report that they sent Mr. Johnson, Dr. Johnson, sorry, he put together his own report noting that he believed that this was a homicide and he sent it to the military. In that report, Dr. Johnson included a picture of a CD that he received in one of the packages of evidence that he was sent. And that CD was photographed, but the actual CD was not in the evidence. He did not receive the actual CD. So he formally requested that they send it to him. And the Army flat out told him he was not entitled to that CD which, of course, only made Dr. Johnson want it more. For sure. He was like, yes. What's on is, it then? He's like, that is absolutely, um, I am entitled to see it. I'm entitled to have anything related to my daughter's death. I'm, I'm the only person who is entitled to see that. Um, and they refused. They told him to go to their legal team. So he um, ordered a Freedom of Information Act request to get the CD. That was denied. Finally, a congressman named Lacey Clay got involved and publicly demanded that CD. I had a brave young constituent by the name of Private Lavina Johnson. And sadly, in July of 2005, at the age of 19, she became the first female soldier from Missouri to be killed in Iraq. Uh, Just like Corporal Tillman, Private Johnson was an exceptional young American. She was an honor student, a gifted musician, and very active in her church and community. And just like Corporal Tillman after 9-11, she was inspired to join the Army to help protect her country. For almost two years, Dr. and Mrs. Johnson have been trying to get to the truth about what happened 
to their daughter. Unfortunately, they have been met by a wall of disrespect, evasion, and failure, and a failure to provide them with the answers that the parents of any fallen soldier deserve. And I am thankful that this committee is taking action to get them the information they have questioned. I believe that this issue comes before you about uh, Private First Class Lavinia Johnson. Are you familiar with the uh, Freedom of Information request that I've sent forward? Uh, no, I'm not. Have not seen that request well, yet. Can we count on the Army to uh, to deal with this issue? In a, in a, as soon as we get that request, we will process it during a Congress session or whatever the fuck that is. The military <laughs> representative. Yeah. Brigadier General Rodney Johnson, when uh, Lacey Clay was like, uh, this is Livina Johnson. He talks about her and there, there's a clip. I'll, I've posted it. Um, he's he was like, oh, I, have, I haven't heard of this request. And then Lacey Clay's like, OK, well, can you help us out? Can you get it done? He's like, yeah, as soon as I get it, I, I, I'll take a look. Um, and finally, so uh, but then behind closed doors, he was like, no, you can't have it. And so finally, the congressman, Lacey Clay, was able to retrieve that CD basically by force. And what okay. was on that CD was horrific. They what did end up getting it. The CD contained full color photographs of Lavina's naked body before her autopsy. So, so do you think they made a mistake in putting the photo of the CD in the evidence? Yes. Okay. I think somebody, they were like, okay, photocopy all this stuff. And somebody was like, okay, I'll photocopy all this stuff. But that maybe the person who gave the order didn't know, either didn't know what was on the CD or like sh should have hidden it. But I, I think they made a mistake. For and sure. I think it's interesting that they didn't like destroy the CD. Yeah. Well, I think that would have been even sketchier. It was like, because Congress is involved and like, we know you have the CD give it over okay got it got it like it's public i don't i i don't know yeah makes sense. anyway so the are in the army's report the only injuries they discuss are the gunshot wound to the head and some broken teeth and it was when dr johnson finally got his hands on the cd that he was presented with more of her injuries oh god lavina johnson and some of these we already know but i'll i'll just give you a full full play by play okay. Lavina Johnson had a broken nose that had been put back into place she had a fracture at the base of her skull essentially she had a broken neck so not quite sure how she shot herself when she had a broken neck yeah it's weird she also had a, a big burn on the back of her right thigh I've seen some places where it said that she had burns on both of her thighs her back was also charred there was a particularly which and this is particularly curious as she was found with her clothes on, but the clothes did not have burns. So this indicates that she was burned without clothes and then clothes were put back on. There were unexplained cuts and what appeared to be bite marks all over her torso. So weird. Her stomach was full of bruises. How, Some... how are they saying this is a suicide? How? Back <laughs> in this case is so fucked up. Wow. Her elbow was completely dislocated. And worst of all, worst of all, there was severe damage to her vagina. It appeared wow. that there had been some sort of, and this is Dr. Johnson's claim. I'll just say that. It appeared that there had been some sort of caustic substance. And caustic substance, for anyone who doesn't know, is a chemical that is capable of damaging living tissue. Poured into her vagina. Uh, through Dr. Johnson's research, he hypothesizes that this acidic substance was lye. Right. This is so, so, so upsetting when you think it through. Dr. It's, Johnson, yeah. he had asked them when he found out that his daughter had been raped. He asked them if they did a rape kit on his daughter before doing the autopsy or during the autopsy. And uh, they said, no, we didn't do a rape kit because there were no signs of sexual assault because this was a suicide and then he gets these photographs which were taken prior to the autopsy and were most likely taken by the person who did the autopsy and he saw photos of that and there's also injuries to her vagina that looked like he he says that they look like a bullet that had ricocheted and like cut her on the outside so the person who did the autopsy who said that there was no signs of sexual assault which is why they didn't do a rape kit took these photos 
kind of seems like there might have been a sexual assault. Kind of seems like somebody's fucking lying here. Yeah. And yeah, and that's that's exactly what it indicates. Why would you pour an acidic substance into somebody's vagina to cover up DNA? Why else? What and other there possible were literally reason? physical signs of a sexual assault. Yes. Like there's physical signs of a brutal just straight up assault yeah. and physical signs of a sexual assault. Like it's impossible that this would have been a suicide. Nobody would do this to themselves. So after all this shit came to light, they the family and like had gone to the media and I guess I don't know if they were doing GoFundMe or but they they got extra money. Their family was able to do a second autopsy, and the second autopsy and this is where the bullet in the tongue comes to light. The second autopsy revealed that parts of her tongue, vagina, and anus had been removed. Removed. No mention of where they went. Removed. Like in a surgical manner? I don't know if they were taken during it. If you're thinking about it, they're thinking that the bullet would have ended up in her tongue. And yeah. the, we're thinking that the bullet was a nine millimeter bullet and not yeah. an M16 bullet. So whoever did this would want the where the bullet ended up to be gone, thus yeah. removal of the tongue. Then there's removal, like there's removal of her vagina and of her anus like which is it like chopped away yes which removes the acidic substance and this is in the photos that on the cd no this is in the second autopsy so they saw the photos they they uh redug her up what is that called again oh they, exhumed yeah they exhumed her body and they went to go look at her body and they found out after some photos it. that those parts of her were removed so you would have to assume, since there's photos of her vagina intact, that's kind really of, weird. Before the first autopsy, the only place that they could have been removed was during that first autopsy, and possibly yeah. you could say, "Hey, look, maybe they removed part of it to like test the substance." Yeah, but that was not documented or ever mentioned. Yeah, very suspicious. Like, there's nothing more suspicious. I've never heard of something more suspicious. Everything in my about life. this is like. I mean, I'm sure we are somewhat biased as women, I guess. Like, I don't know if that plays a role. But I've mom. heard a lot of men talk about this case and yeah. they all say the same thing. I'm trying to be as unbiased agreed, like, agreed. and objective, but it is, like, overwhelming. Where's your fucking vagina? Like, Yeah. What'd you do with it? Why'd you? Like, where is it? Like, if yeah. you take it out in a re- for a, a reason, which maybe there was a reason, yeah. you got to fucking write that in the report. Yeah. yeah. You can't just take shit and like it can't be just be gone and especially like if if that's where the bullet ended up then that's like straight up just covering up evidence that's yeah what about the gloves the gloves in her hands like that just it doesn't make sense no so all of this is super shady and it reeks of a cover-up yeah and to this day the case remains closed and the case because it happened in the military this was like a CID investigation. Remember Jeffrey Donald? The like most right. competent investigators that we have. Yeah. Um, so after the fact, the military has just said that they're satisfied with their investigation and they believe Lavina committed suicide. They have not budged on that. So what do we think actually happened? What do we, the people of the internet and such, what do we think happened? Well, the family's lawyer, Donald Watkins, has a theory. He posted a three-part blog post describing the case as he sees it. Um, And let me get through the whole thing. This, to me, seems a little weird, but we'll get through it and we'll discuss. Okay. So here's a quote from the post. Quote, All of the physical and forensic evidence needed to classify Private Johnson's death as a murder was available to the military investigators in 2005. At the subtle suggestion of her base commander in Ballad, Iraq, the investigators chose to look the other way as they developed this homicide case around a paper-thin suicide theory. Private Johnson was killed over her inadvertent discovery of a commander's adulterous affair. Oh, This is what he thinks happened. So Donald goes on to explain that on the night of Lavina's death, he says she encountered this unnamed commander who he never named. This commander and his lover in the act of having an affair. When that happened, a physical altercation took place and this unnamed commander attacked Lavina, causing most of her physical injuries. Her broken nose, broken neck, scratches, bruises, knocked out her teeth, whatever. So assuming if he broke her neck like she's 
dead or can't move. Then this man dragged Lavina into the tent and staged her body. And this is where you kind of lose me a little bit, but staged it to make it look like a rape and then suicide. And he did this by pouring lye into her vagina to make it look like somebody is trying to cover up a rape. And then by shooting her in the head and placing a spent casing under her leg. But in this theory, the man shot her with a nine millimeter gun, but left the shell casing of the M16 bullet and like left her M16 rifle. Then this man set the tent on fire and ran. Here's another quote from him. Quote, the military controlled every aspect of the crime scene. It ran the criminal investigation. It performed the first autopsy, thinking there would be no second autopsy. And it zealously guarded access to investigative files. The military thought the truth surrounding Private Johnson's murder would be buried with the body. The nature and scope of these cover-up activities usually occur when the killer is a top military official. End quote. So, okay. I have some questions. I don't have answers to those questions, but I have some questions. And, okay, so that's his theory. But I'm wondering, like, if – why would he shoot her with a 9mm and leave the M16 shell casing? Like, why not just shoot her with the M16? And why the lie? Like, did he actually rape her? Why would he need to stage a rape and then a suicide? Like, is part of the staging to make it look like she committed suicide because of the rape? I just, to me, it doesn't, I don't really get it. I read, because he's got a whole write-up about it, and we'll I'll post the link to it in the notes. I just don't, parts of it don't really make sense to me. Like, maybe the theory is that he panicked and just did, like, a really weird job at covering things up because he, like, didn't know what he was, he was, like, kind of in a daze. I don't know. I yeah, read the thing. weird. I read it very thoroughly, and I'm pretty sure that that's what he's trying to say, like, you guys can read it if you want. I would think that it's whoever acu- whoever she was accusing of raping her potentially who did it. Well, Donald Johnson claims that it's not that person. Interesting. Um, and they found this note in her things, which was just a chain of com- of her command, which like the person who's above her, then the person who's above that person, the person who's above that person. And this person who he's saying is the person who did it, is the person at the top of her chain of command. Interesting. Like, this is an identified person but that they have not given the name of. Okay. Now, I do think this this situation is, po- like, it's possible, for sure. Yeah. And even if this situation is not what happened and it's not an accurate theory, it does not mean that the suicide theory is correct. There's probably, you could have a ton of different theories yeah. based on that, right? There's no way the suicide theory is correct, so. I just, like... Take that off the table. Other people read it and tell me that that's what he's trying. He, he does say, like, the person who covered it up made, like, two kind of contradictory, uh, like, the rape and the and the suicide. And he's like, they contradict each other, but that's what he did. So I okay. don't know. Um, we do not have the name of this unnamed commander, but Donald Watkins does. And he knows that after the murder, President George W. Bush and then Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld went on to then kick this person out of the military. And he believes that they were kicked out of the the military because of this murder, and then it was covered up by everyone involved in the CID investigation. Donald says, quote, The military involved in the cover-up of Army Private Lavina Johnson's 2005 murder never thought anyone would care enough about the 19-year-old low-ranking military, uh, the 19-year-old low-ranking black soldier on a military base in Iraq to break this criminal case wide open. They were terribly wrong. End quote. And this is correct. This. I mean, a lot of injustices were happening happening in Iraq. So. Sadly, the American military is very well known for sexual assault and rape, and they have been known to cover things up to protect their own reputation. I've heard that. U.S. Army Reserve Colonel Anne Wright, ex-military, got involved with the case and with the Johnson family. Um, She's ex-military, and she spends a lot of her time warning others about the culture and prevalence of sexual assault and violence experienced by women in the military. And she claims that there is a very pervasive pattern of non-combated related, non-combat Non, sorry, non-combat related deaths following instances of rapes. And often these rapes are listed as suicide or undetermined. Their deaths are listed as suicide yeah. or uh, suicides are undetermined. And they often follow a, what they claim was a sexual assault. 
Anne and many others see this scenario as common for a number of reasons. First of all, the military is very male dominant, obviously. The culture is very much similar to like a police force where everyone vouches for each other and the there's a big uh, point made on saving face for the group as a whole to the outside. There's low accountability. The chain of command also keeps lower ranking soldiers in line and ensures people keep quiet. Yeah. Now, women and men, for that matter, are particularly vulnerable when they are new, they're young, they're overseas, and they come from a family with little means who will not ask questions, which is the exact type of person that the military typically targets. Yeah. So what happened to Lavina Johnson? I don't know. But somebody knows. And we should not stop talking about this case until the Johnson family finally get the truth that they deserve. Now, it would be irresponsible of me not to include the statement by the military and let them have their say too. So I will read their statement now. Statement regarding PFC Lavina Johnson investigation. U.S. Army Criminal Investigations Command. Sorry, quote on the outside. CID's extensive investigation found... PFC Lavina Johnson's death to be from a self-inflicted gun, gunshot wound. The, this finding coincides with the opinion rendered by the Office of the Armed Forces Medical Examiner, whose findings also determined the death to be from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. CID conducted a very thorough investigation as well as a very thorough review of the case and stands by the findings of our investigation. As as with all CID cases, if new information pertinent to this investigation becomes available, CID will reopen and investigate if warranted. That was by Jeffrey Castro, U.S. Army Criminal Investigations Command, Public Affairs, end quote. Okay. That's their story and they're sticking to it. Now, I will end on um, Donald Watkins. What concerns do you have about the backlash that may come your way because you're making some explosive claims. None, because I don't make them if I can't back them up. I've got enough experience doing this stuff. I've been against a lot of powerful institutions and entities. And when you are covering up, you can't think of everything. And when you've done 43 years of this work, you've seen just about every kind of technique used and you know what to look for. I don't, just, I don't need to go ask a bunch of witness statements. Let me take what you give me and let me take your forensic stuff and generally the answer is gonna be there in what you give me. But in this case, it was even better because there was a whole set of other factors going on uh, in Washington, D.C. that related to people who were in Iraq, top commanders who were in Iraq, that explained to me greater the motive of what had happened and usually when there's a cover-up it's only for big people it's not for little people we are about as the crow flies about two and a half miles from the white house yes and about three and a half miles from the pentagon yes what do you want the highest ranks of government to do i, I want them to for one time tell the truth you don't have to lie it's not necessary to lie she was murdered she was murdered she wasn't murdered by some enemy combatant. You know, she volunteered to serve her country. This wasn't a draft situation. She came to Iraq. Anybody who's coming to Iraq in the middle of a war is prepared to put their life on the line for their country. And the least that their country can do is be true to them, be loyal to them. And that is what galls me about this whole thing. This is not hard to figure out that this was a murder. Nobody is that incompetent that they can't figure out the forensic evidence is pointing them toward murder. Nobody's that income. But what people tend to do is when a murder or any other crime, whether it's committing perjury, whether it's giving false statements to law enforcement official, involves a higher up, a commander, they just like to look the other way. Now, I don't subscribe to that philosophy. I just follow the evidence wherever it leads. I, I, I didn't kill her, so I can follow the evidence wherever it leads. And I think what happened in this case, this is, I think what happened, they look, you got a 19-year-old black girl 
Nobody knows her name. She is 6,620 miles away from home on a military base. We have this base secured. Our own uh, group is doing the investigation. Nobody can come behind us. Nobody will ever see our files. It took an act of Congress almost to get the files. Her body will be in the ground soon. Nobody's gonna dig her up to check and balance what we say in our, our uh, files. And I think they counted on, and this involves one of our buddies who served the nation with distinction for more than three decades. And I think that's the way they look at it. And yes, they grieve the Dr. Johnson. At some level they do, but not enough to, to, to do the truth. And so I, I, I would, if I was uh, President Barack Obama, this would take about 20 seconds, because he's a lawyer too. You know, you can look at it. This is not hard stuff. You don't, if you've seen CSI on TV, this is not hard. Dr. I, would ask them yeah. to, I would ask them to find somebody qualified and capable, independent, to investigate this and to bring the criminal charges. There is no statute of limitations on murder. Bring the criminal charges. And that's what I want to see happen. This case is like particularly enraging for obvious reasons, but also just yeah. because it is so clear that the military, you know, I don't know what, who knew, like, it's impossible to say, like, is this a huge conspiracy where a lot of people, like, were like, okay, you rape turned culture, we're going to legit cover it up. Or is this a case of them being like, okay, going to the medical examiner being like, we think this is a suicide, you know, like, you know, kind of just like basically telling people what to say without giving explicit instructions, both of which are bad. But it's very clear that the, whoever decided that they're covering this up, they saw this girl's body. They saw the extensive damage done to this girl's body. Anybody who looked at her body could tell that this was not a simple suicide. Of course. They looked at her and they said to her family, your daughter committed suicide. Here she is. And just expected them to just take it. And I'm sure yeah. that in a lot of cases – that would have happened, that people would not have asked questions or that people would not have felt that they were strong enough to go up against the United States military. Yeah. But this girl's father is a fucking amazing man and he is not resting until he figures this shit out. And the army was absolutely not expecting that. And they should feel absolutely ashamed of themselves because that is a horrific thing to do especially if you do get away with it. How awful is that? I know. I think that the people who were involved in it, like I'm assuming it's probably not a one-time thing and it, um, it's really fucked up that that happened even one time, but I feel like it, it was so just like not even questioned. It's just like, yeah. And his father mentioned like, because he had to deal with, um, the uh, Congressman Lacey Clay, who's gotten involved in other cases of this, there was an in the Congress hearing or whatever. I don't know what it is. I've heard of several cases of this. Like, yeah, there was a guy named I think Pat Tillman, who was a big case that this happened to. There was a, other girls like I started looking into. This there's girl, another Anne woman, Wright. too. Yeah, there's a couple. There's the Vanessa I know of another Dean one, case, too, which is really yeah, was, that, uh, that. pretty recent as well. And it's very clear that kind of similar. It's that like the CID, the what is it, Criminal Investigation Department? Or, I don't know what it what it stands for within the military. Just like they're like, CID, okay, yeah. somebody died. Probably it's suspicious, but let's just call this a suicide and call it a day. Yeah, these are people's fucking lives, and not only that, but like these are people who put their lives on the line to go to war for their country. Like that yeah. is not a small thing to do. This girl was in Iraq. Okay, she was. I mean, I don't think whoever controversial did it cares. No, but it's like look at the big picture of it. That's the, I'm just saying. Like, I think this they're is why picking people vulnerable so people, mad. though. Yeah, and people that like, un, like Lavina has her family to stand up for her, and she has an amazing family who does a very good job at standing up for her. But there's a lot of people who don't have yeah. families like that, right? right? How many people are dead and buried in the ground, and fa their family thinks that they committed suicide? When they absolutely did not, and they did not receive yeah. justice. It's just when you really think about it, it's even when you just slightly think about it, it's horrific. It's so upsetting. 
So I believe that there is a change.org petition. I know the the guy dreading, I don't know his name or phrase, um, but he put the petition, it's a petition to reopen the case. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can find that and put that in the notes of this video as well. If you'd like to sign it, I don't know why you wouldn't, but uh, yeah, let's all sign it. Um, I think the petition is doing very well. I have to even check because it might be finished, but I'm pretty sure it's still open. Um, let's sign that bitch and let's keep talking about the case. That's why I was not hesitant. I was hesitant, but I, I decided to do this one because it is unsolved and it's unfinished business. And so yeah. I think the more people who do videos on about, about it, the better. And there's still a potential that this could be looked into. It's yeah. recent enough that like probably all the people involved are still relevant and yeah. yeah so let us know what you think did this anger you do you think that it was a suicide if you if you think it was a suicide i'm dying to know how nobody Why? does <laughs> if you if that person exists please come forward i'll be nice but like you know tell me what you got um and other than that look us up you can find us on Instagram at Who's Knocking Podcast, Twitter at Who's Knocking Pod, email us hello at Who's Knocking Podcast.com. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. That would be dope. That would be awesome. And you can also sign up for my newsletter at grimweekly.com. And stay safe out there because you never know who's knocking. This podcast is produced in collaboration with Lost Line Media. Artwork by August Digital. Music by Matthew Cook.